I'll tell you, I stumbled across the first FDA-approved MR ultrasound fusion gizmo in 2008 at the AUA in Orlando. It was a, uh, a, a device made by a small company in Northern California. Uh, and there was one man, one woman, a small little corner booth, a crowd around the machine, and a stack of cards that said, if you're interested in this product, fill out one of these cards, someone will call on you. So I filled out the card, and two weeks later, uh, a man and a woman and a laptop showed up in my office and gave me a demo, and I was very impressed, and um, we uh, got one at UCLA March 23rd, 2009, and have uh, sort of hitched our wagon to this. It's been a, a really interesting ride. The, uh, the first MRI uh, ever published of the prostate was in the year 1983. It was by a lady named Hetty Richak, who was at UC San Francisco. They've been interested in this a long time. Uh, and it's interesting because all you, about all you can see in this T1 uh, image on a uh, magnet of very little power, 0 0.3 Tesla, about all you can see is the Foley catheter uh, inside the prostate. And so how, how times have changed over the past 30 years or so, our sophisticated uh, MRI have, have really changed the world of prostate uh, pathology. The, um, the multiparametric MRI as demonstrated here includes a, a T2 weighted image which is the best for the spatial resolution of the tumor, diffusion weighted imaging which uh, is an index of density, how, how closely packed the cells are, how much water molecules move around within that area dynamic contrast enhancement, which tells about the movement of, of gadolinium into and out of the prostate. And then in this perfect case, we've got the uh, tumor that corresponds nicely uh, in a whole mount section, corresponds nicely to the actual findings on the uh, MRI. So, so there are different ways to do targeted prostate biopsy. Uh, the first way that was done, and this really started in, uh, in the Netherlands, a uh, pioneer named Jelly Barents, who's at Nijmegen in the Netherlands, he's visited UCLA a few times to get us started, but it can be done inside an MRI tube. It's very cumbersome, very laborious. Uh, the uh, uh, in vivo division of Philips has developed a modified uh, device for doing transrectal biopsies of the prostate uh, inside an MRI tube, you have to slide the patient out to place the needle, put them back in to confirm that the, uh, that the needle is in the right place, et cetera. It may take hours, it's expensive, it's labor intensive. And we thought that if you would, could use MRI ultrasound fusion technology to do this, it would keep it a urological procedure and let us do the same thing, but in a clinic setting at a much better price with just about the same accuracy. So uh, this is a, uh, uh, an example of how the in-bore in biopsies are done. The uh, MRI, you have to get an MRI first to localize a lesion and be sure you've got something you want to biopsy, and then either in a second trip to the MRI or later that same a uh, day after you've gotten this uh, film processed, then you have to put the uh, needle in and perform the second biopsy. So, so this can be done. There's nothing wrong with it, uh, except that it's very cumbersome, very laborious, very expensive, and I encourage you, if you're just be getting into this, not to let the radiologist take this away from you. It really belongs as a urological procedure. So. Now along comes this little miracle called image fusion, which lets us, uh, the definition of this is that it, uh, it's a process of combining relevant information from two or more images into a single image with the resulting image being more informative than any of the images alone. So the uh, US military has uh, pioneered image fusion actually like uh, like many other things they've pioneered. Let me show you how the, the Army uses this. Turn up the, the volume. Vision goggle, which is, which is fusion, and it allows you. you to have the illumination, intensification, and the IR. The night vision goggles, the illumination, intensification is really going to drop off, and the performance is going to go away. 
from an infrared point of view, in a zero light condition, you're just dealing with thermals or you're dealing with the heat. And it gives you a capability to detect targets at a much farther range than you can with the night vision goggles. So by putting those together, you really get the best of both worlds based on what your atmospherics are and based on what you're really trying to do. So there's several ways that image fusion can be used. We call this the, the poor man's image fusion, where you get the idea from the radiologist where the lesion is and then try to go to that same spot uh, on ultrasound. This, this can be done. It's better than no kind of image fusion at all, but it's not as good, especially in small lesions, uh, as, uh, as a software fusion, which we'll talk about. So, so as I said, this was our first e experience with uh, image-guided prostate biopsies. Uh, the setup is as such, you use a ultrasound machine, this can be any conventional ultrasound machine. Uh, the the, uh, via, the uh, fusion device we've been using is called the Artemis device. It's made by a little company in Northern California called Eigen, the I-G-E-N. They have previously had a relationship with Hitachi, which helped to market uh, the device. The um, I have no a material interest in this company at all, but we did obtain this device very early on, either the first or the second machine that was sold. It's interesting, this image fusion device was approved by the FDA through what's called the 510K approval route, which is a special route for devices to get approved without any human testing. Uh, and so uh, it, it's called the predicate route. They, they had to demonstrate that they did essentially the same thing as something that was already on the market and they were able to get this approved without any human testing, and we kind of became their, their testing lab and, uh, and have had uh, a lot of fun with it and learned a lot about it. There are, there are two <clears throat> principal devices in the United States that are being used. Uh, the one we obtained at UCLA in 2009 is shown here. They're, they're a little different, but it's interesting, the results with the different machines, and there are about a half a dozen of them actually in use worldwide, the results being published are all very similar. Uh, this, the Artemis device, has three components. It has a, um, a tracking arm, which is uh, very interesting. It's, it works by form, forming a little GPS system uh, for the uh, spatial orientation and tracking of, of targeted biopsies. It includes a, uh, the guts of the machine, which is a computer to do the image fusion and a monitor where the work is done. Uh, the lion's share of the market in the United States is, is taken by uh, a, the Euro in vivo division of Philips Electronics. This is called the Euronav device. This, this device has about maybe 70% uh, of the market in the United States, not quite as much worldwide. Uh, and it e works by forming a little um, electromagnetic field. It's, for, it's a, like a small MRI that goes over the patient's uh, pelvis and, uh, and helps target the, the uh, lesion. This is, these are both for the purpose of fusing real-time ultrasound with stored MRI images. Uh, I should say there are others uh, in operation as well, there's a one called the Coelus, which is made by a French company, the Biopsy by a German company. So, so there's, this is an evolutionary state, but this is where we are right now. So the point is that if you've got a good radiologist and he knows how to read prostate MRIs, and this is not a simple matter, uh, that he can draw a line around the region of interest Using the fusion device, you can then bring it into the ultrasound and fuse it with real-time ultrasound, create a 3D reconstructed model of the prostate, as shown in brown here, and then do both targeted and systematic uh, biopsies, which are recorded in the software of the device, allowing uh, two things, not only targeting, which is shown in the, the blue target right here, but also by what we call tracking, or uh, being able to remember where the spots came from. This is uh, important in active surveillance, uh, to be able to allow us to know where the biopsy came from that is of interest and allow us to go back to just that spot. 
The, uh, the, co the concept here is simple. It brings the accuracy of MRI, precision and accuracy of MRI, into an office setting. I uh, do agree with uh, many of the points that uh, Scott made, and that is that MRI is certainly not perfect. And the more of a beginner your radiologist is, the less perfect it's going to be. And you have to appreciate this in starting a program. There is a thing called PIRADS. Prostate Imaging Reporting and Data System. This is an attempt to standardize the performance and interpretation of MRI uh, tests as they're done. PIRAD scores go from one to five. One and two are considered insignificant. This is an example of a PIRADS three lesion in the peripheral zone here in the left side of the prostate. Uh, and uh, in, our, in our experience, which is uh, a, a lot right now, we find that about 24% of PIRADS three lesions uh, contain a clinically significant prostate cancer. And we define clinically significant as any element of Gleason score four uh, in, in the lesion, three plus four are more. This is the old, uh, the old Gleason scoring system with the uh, new Gleason grade groupings. This would be a, pi a, a grade group uh, two or more. That's what we define as clinically significant. The appearance, of, uh, we believe that the appearance of any pattern four makes this a tumor that you need to watch. This is a, a, a PIRADS grade four lesion shown here. It's larger and on T2 it's darker than, uh, than in a grade three lesion. The chances of this being a clinically significant prostate cancer approach, uh, 40%. And this is a PIRADS-5, example of a PIRADS-5 lesion, larger still, darker still. These are just the T2 images. I'm not showing all of the components here. Uh, but uh, you're putting them all together, which is done to make a PIRADS score, the chances of this PIRADS-5 lesion containing clinically significant prostate cancer is about 80%. And if we get a negative biopsy, on one of these targeted biopsies of a pyrides 5 lesion and it comes back negative, we always bring the patient back subsequently uh, to repeat uh, the biopsy and, and, and uh, see if there's anything really there. But there's not always, because MRI is not always perfect. It's an important part of this, of this talk. This shows some data we put together uh, a few years ago the, with the pyrides grades grouping shown here down on the horizontal axis, the chances of finding clinically significant prostate on the vertical axis. Look at uh, PIRADS grades four and five, it's uh, the, the most interesting. System systematic biopsies only show about uh, this amount of tumor, the lowest of the bars. When you use targeted only, you get to an intermediate level, which is still higher still. And when you combine both systematic and targeted biopsies together, which is something that we have learned as a very important lesson over the years, you get the highest likelihood of finding a clinically significant cancer. So, so the people who say you just need, and the radiologists are very guilty of this, where they say there's a spot, all we need to do is put a needle in there, sample that spot one time, two times, and that's, that's gonna tell us what we've got. We don't believe that. Uh, and I think we've got a lot of data to show it. This shows it quite clearly that if you only do targeted or only do systematic, you're not going to find as many clinically significant cancers as when you combine them together. Both the uh, American Urological Association and the Society of Abdominal Radiology have endorsed MR ultrasound guided biopsies for people who have had a previous negative biopsy by a conventional route. So, so this has now been endorsed. It has not yet been endorsed for first timers, for people who've not had a biopsy before. I think you're going to see this happen in the next, uh, in the next year or two, because uh, it's going to be so patient driven. Um, my, my best referral source right now is Dr. Google, uh, a man who finds a uh, finds us on the internet and says, you know, I don't want a blind biopsy. I, I, want, I want a targeted biopsy. So I think this is going to grow. There are some barriers to entry of this. I'll go through those with you in just one second. I just want to emphasize another thing uh, 
everybody knows about the targeting function of these bi guided biopsies, but the tracking function is kind of the unsung hero of MR ultrasound guided biopsies. We uh, did a little study early on when we started getting into this where we took men uh, who were undergoing biopsy and we uh, did a uh, systematic biopsy uh, shown in green as our targets with your initial biopsy, took the probe out, cleaned it, let them walk around a little bit, got them back on the table and re-biopsied them, attempting to go back to the original spots where the uh, biopsy was taken first. And we found that the average error is only a couple of millimeters. So we can go back very precisely to a, uh, to a follow-up uh, in, in re-biopsying a previously positive site, very valuable in active surveillance. If you're thinking about doing this and want to get started, the very first thing you've got to do is get a cooperative agreement with your radiologist. It's, it's interesting, most uh, radiologists cannot read a prostate MRI. And so if your uh, friendly radiologist down the block says you don't have to send your patient to a distant institution, we can do that for you. Be sure about that before you trust him with it, because if he draws a circle around the wrong place, it's uh, not going to do anybody a favor. And unfortunately, the radiologists uh, should be shamed. They, they have not uh, devised a credentialing system yet to, to create expert uh, training in, in uh, reading prostate MRIs. They're talking about this in England, but they have not even started talking about it yet in the United States. You develop your image fusion procedure. You have to decide what machine you want to use. The, the device makers are all happy to help you get started. Uh, we uh, favor the Artemis device. We had the Euronav device for a time. They're, they're all producing relatively uh, similar results. Uh, the pathologist has to get on board. Our pathologist uh, said to me when we started sending him all these uh, specimens and we wanted each one segregated so we could go back to that spot if possible, he said, uh, uh, he said, you're my best customer, but I lose money on every case. So, so it's going to require some involvement and cooperation by your pathologist. And then when you start offering this to patients, I think, for example, if you're in a, a, a town of a couple hundred thousand, there are two or three urology groups in this town, uh, sorry, urology groups in this town, and you're offering this, uh, you are going to have a leg up on the competition. It'll be a wonderful sales uh, tool for your practice. Everybody wants to know, how do you pay for this? Is it cost effective? Uh, there's some data that we have kind of put together from the AUA uh, that if you're doing 20 a month of these fusion biopsies and getting 300 bucks per biopsy, that uh, you'll pay, pay this off in about two and a half years. If you split it with the radiology department, and the, they should be, be involved because the radiologists are profiting like, like crazy from all of these MRIs that are, that are being offered, then you can get them to split it with you. You're going to pay it off much more quickly. But this has to be looked at as a joint venture, a collaborative effort between groups. So to, to make a long story short, uh, we've done about 3,500 of these over the years, and here's what we've learned. The procedure is safe and efficient. We do this in 15 minutes, um, start to finish. It's a lot longer than a, a trust bi guided biopsy, which I did for many years. It is a lot longer, but the payoff is so much greater. High quality MRI is absolutely essential. You're wasting your time if you don't have a good radiologist that you can depend on. PIRADS is the most important predictor of what you're going to find on that biopsy. A close second is PSA density. When you put these together, you can exclude some patients from biopsy. If a patient has a, a no, no visible lesion and a low PSA density, the chances of him having a significant prostate cancer in our experience is very low. Targeting and templating biopsies are both very important. They should both be done together. And what you see on the MRI is not always equivalent to what's there pathologically. Scott made this point, and uh, we certainly are aware of it, well aware of it. We'll talk about it in a little bit more. We talk about uh, focal therapy. 